Good morning and welcome to Sardis Baptist Church Sunday School time. Today we'll be looking at Luke chapter 9 and the key verses are 18 through 27. Please get your Bibles handy. We will look at some other scriptures, but, but those are the focal points or focal verses we want to look at today. First of all, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Every Sunday school time that we have here generally is open with prayer. And we have a list. Our own class has a list. Each class, I suspect, has a list of many different needs, and they're various. As always, life has thrown challenges to all of us. And there's much need for prayer on every different phase of life. Uh, but today especially, let's remember our country, our leaders. Let's pray for their divine wisdom that God would share with them his plans. And I pray that we would, as a country, humble ourselves before God, return to him, that we might once again be a God-fearing and a God-loving group of people in this nation. Let's pray. Our Father, we're humbled that you would even hear our prayers. We're thankful that you loved us enough that you gave your son to pay our sin debt that would allow us to pray in his name and to you directly. Father, we thank you for loving us beyond all of our faults. You loved us before we loved you and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you made the plan of salvation possible even for a child to understand enough to invite you into their hearts and their lives. We thank you for the Savior, your Son, that came here among us, lived among us, showed us how much you loved us, and gave himself ultimately for our sins and the punishment for our sins. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, I pray for our country. I pray that, Lord, we would humble ourselves before you as a people, as individuals, and Lord, as leaders in our country, I pray for them that they would acknowledge you, Lord, as a God and not anyone else or anything else that they would acknowledge you. Give them wisdom. Lord, we know that they need it in all areas. And Lord, only you are the source of wisdom and we pray for that. God, we just thank you for the blessings of life. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for the promises, Lord, that you've made. Help us now as we open your word, Lord, that we see the challenges before us as modern day people and believers and yet it was for the early believers as well the challenges they faced we ask you to guide us lead us in all parts of life for it's in jesus name we're able to pray amen again thank you for joining us uh, if you have your bibles again look at look at luke it would be in chapter nine mostly but keep your bibles available and close by please because we'll look at some other passages most of them in the New Testament. Maybe one or two that uh, goes back to the Old Testament. But let's read. <clears throat> and I give you just a little bit of background on this before we get into the focal points. But Jesus has just uh, performed one of the miracles of feeding multitude of folks. Uh, the men, I believe, numbered around 5,000. So, you know, add to that the women and the children that were present. But just a miracle among one of his miracles is feeding the multitudes. The question that this lesson asks today is, who is Jesus to me and who is Jesus to you? You know, Jesus asked that question of his disciples. And today when we're looking at that, we need to hear that same question. Who do we think Jesus is and who is Jesus to us personally? The title of the lesson is they've called the title Unashamed. And Jesus calls his disciples to be unashamed. Because if we are ashamed of Jesus, then he could be ashamed of us before his father and would be. And, and Jesus calls us to put him first. You know, that is the challenge both of his first disciples and his today's disciples is to put Jesus first in all that we do and all that we, we our actions and our, and our deeds and our thoughts. So let's read those, uh, let's read those, what, eight or nine verses, I guess it is, verses 18 through 27, out of the book of Luke and out of the chapter nine. 
I'll be reading from my uh, New King James. You read on whatever version or translation you have there before you. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, Who did the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Most of that, as you heard, was Jesus talking to his disciples and asking questions of him. Let's look at those first few verses in 18 through 20, and it talks about Jesus has asked the question. He's, he's been alone there praying, and then he's joined by his disciples. And he asks them. Jesus is becoming, his name and his, his ministry is becoming pretty well known around the area. And it, just as we said, it, he just had fed thousands of folks with a miracle. So his ministry is taking off and becoming known among the area. And Jesus asked his, his disciples, the men that are following him, the ones that are closest to him, and he says, who do the crowds say that I am? And well, they, you know, they begin to answer. Uh, some say, verse 19, some say you're John the Baptist. Well, they weren't really familiar with the fact that Jesus and John the Baptist's ministry overlapped uh, at the point there. But some say Elijah, you know, maybe it's Elijah. And then others say, you're just one of the old prophets that has risen again from the dead. You know, if we look to where it says, some thought Jesus was a prophet, if we look back just a couple of chapters in verse, I guess chapter 7 and verse 16, I believe it is, uh, let me find that one here. Yes. Then fear came upon. Then fear came upon all of them, and they glorified God, saying, "A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited His people." So some thought he was a prophet. Some thought he, you know, he was Elijah. Some thought John the Baptist. But look, let's look at verse. 7 and 8 in chapter 9. We're very close to where we were. In verses 7 and 8. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. Jesus talking about. And he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. And by some that Elijah had appeared. And by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. You know... Even the disciples, the early disciples, pondered and wondered many things about Jesus and the ministry. And just exactly, they didn't understand all of what Jesus had told them to this point. But in today's lesson, we're going to find even more challenges that Jesus puts out to them. Well, let's read one other verse, uh, and that's chapter 8, verse 25, if you want to turn back at just a page or so. But he said to them, and this is Jesus speaking, but he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the waters, 
and they obeyed. You know, the disciples, even though they had seen many miracles, still didn't understand. Here was a man among them that could command nature like it was his very own. And it was. Because he and the Father were the creators. And so Jesus was curious to them. They were learning just as uh, any young believer would learn. More about him each day and each time and the hours they spent with him. But yet they still didn't totally grasp it all. Now, when some of them says Elijah, well, let's, that's one place we want to look back. We want to look back at 2 Kings. Uh, let's see here. I believe it's uh, chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. Let's see what that's got to say. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. And this is speaking about Elijah now. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So you know there's, there's a few people, only a few people, that didn't experience a natural death. Elijah being one of those. He's carried away by a whirlwind right up to God's presence and to be with the Lord. You know, most people, some of those that had watched his miracles, some of those that were even fed by his miracles, they really had no clue who Jesus was. They couldn't understand his teachings or his works. Well, in verse 20, back in our, in our focal point, in verse 20, interestingly enough, Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? You know, he's, he's heard what they've said about the people, what the crowds say about him. Now he's asking his disciples. He wants to know what they at this point, understand about who he is and, and what he's here for. Well, you might, you might already know, and if you didn't, you might guess. If you read it, any at all, you might guess that Peter gives an answer. Peter uh, was a character, uh, didn't hold back too many things, you know, when he had a thought or he had, a, had something to say. But Peter answers here in that uh, 20th verse, and he says, the Christ of God. In other words, the Messiah, the promised one, God's anointed one. And you know, all mankind today, we must all answer that same question. Who do we say that Jesus is? Is he just a character out of history that was a good man? Is he our Savior and our Lord? What is he to us today? That is a question that every individual that hears the gospel must answer today. Who is Jesus to you? Now, I said something earlier about we're thankful for the gospel message that even a child can understand. And that's true, and how grateful we are that that is true. Does children understand all about God's plan? No. Do adults understand all about God's plan? No. But things are revealed to us a day at a time or a moment at a time that we can accept and understand it. As children, when we reach the point of understanding that there's a right and a wrong and that Jesus loved us enough to forgive us of that wrong and pay the price for that, then we can understand that much and we can be saved if we, as children, place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, his death, burial, and resurrection. Today, all mankind faces that question, and we need to ponder that in our hearts and our minds deeply before we flippantly answer who Jesus Christ is. Now, the next few verses talks about the resurrection. Jesus talks about the things that are to come to him and to happen to him. There's some things that uh, his disciples just truly don't, cannot grasp. 
And I don't know that any of us would have grasped it either. You see, we have the, we have the blessed fortune of living in this day and time and having the Bible as we have had now for many, many, many years. And we have the entire New Testament to read from those that were close to Jesus and to understand better. Do we totally still grasp all that Jesus was and is and will be to us? Probably not. But through the Holy Spirit, God will allow us to see and to grow if we're willing to listen. Let's look at, uh, let's look at the next few uh, couple of verses, 21 and 22. And Jesus, this is, this is a little bit curious, but listen. And Jesus strictly warned his disciples and commanded them to tell this to no one. And he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, Jesus is warning his disciples not to spread uninformed ideas about him. Why? Jesus knows. Jesus knows that this could have unintended negative uh, consequences at this time. You see, because it was not time for Jesus' full... He has not completed his ministry here. His earthly ministry was not finished. And if we were to listen to this story in modern times on radio or TV, you would hear this message, stay tuned. You know, stay tuned because Jesus has said, don't go spreading uh, these things that people may say about me because they're uninformed and they really don't know. So don't go sharing that with everybody that you see. My time is not yet finished. I'm not finished in this earthly ministry. So he's, he's basically saying, don't go spreading these rumors or these ideas that men may have that really don't understand. So he does say to them, stay tuned in this fact. Look at verse 22 here carefully. Jesus is now talking to his closest of disciples and he says, listen to what's going to happen, what I, the Messiah, must do. Was this what they were expecting? Absolutely not. Jesus says, you know, here's some things that are going to happen. I'm going to suffer lots of different things. I'll be rejected by the very elders, the chief priests, the scribes. And he says, I'll be killed and be raised the third day. Don't you know that at that point, there was a lot of listening and hearing, but maybe not totally understanding. Nor would we. Nor would we if we were in that point in time, I don't believe. You know, he's explaining to them what's about to come to be. It was not what they expected. Why? Because the popular Jewish thoughts and the Jewish understanding at that time was that he would be a powerful ruler, not a suffering servant. They were looking for one that would rally the Jews, unite the Jews under God's banner and deliver them to victory. Similar to a King David leader. You know, that was a thought in their mind that this, this, this promised Messiah is going to take all of our suppressors away from us and let us be uh, victorious. You know, the news that Jesus was going to be killed and raised the third day, it must have shocked the disciples to their very core. I can imagine just the shock at that moment that they're like, what did he just say? I don't understand. What, I, what's going on here? Let's look at uh, a verse over in Matthew. Let me find it. If you will, chapter 16. <clears throat> Look at Matthew chapter 16. And there's a couple of verses actually I want to read to you here. Verse 17 out of that 16th chapter of Matthew. Jesus is speaking here and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
meaning the answer. This is, this is Matthew's uh, story in the same area here. When Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, you're God's anointed. Jesus says, you're blessed, Simon. But it wasn't anything of your doing that you knew this. This was given to you by a father. My, my heavenly father and your father in heaven. Now, if we skip down just a few verses and look at the 27, I mean, sorry, the 22nd. When Jesus said, I'll be killed, I'll be raised the third day, the shock that came over him, in Matthew's account, he says, then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. See, Peter just couldn't visualize that Jesus was going to be a suffering servant of his father. It just never entered in his mind that it would go to that point. Well, Jesus rebukes Peter, and he warns him not to put human concerns in place of God's plan. Think of that. Do we do that sometimes the same? Do we place our human concerns ahead of God's plans or in place of God's plans? I'm afraid we do. We get up and we make our plans and we go to enact our plans before we accept or we even listen to what God has desired for us or what God wants for us and the action that he might have and the plans that he might have. I'm afraid we're, we're, can't, we're in that regard. We're somewhat like Peter. Lord, no, it can't happen this way, Jesus. That's not going to happen to you. But you know, Jesus called his disciples to follow him unashamedly. And we're about to get into those key verses. Uh, 23 through 27, because everyone that Jesus called, he called them publicly, and their lives would be very public from that point on. When they put a trust in Jesus as the Messiah, as their Savior, then their lives became very focal and very public. And, and they began to speak for Jesus. And they began to preach and to teach in his name. Let's read those last few verses. Uh, take those apart and see what, what Jesus has said to them. And when we look at the 23rd one, it says... If anyone desires to come after me, in other words, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself. Well, there's really three imperatives, imperatives, I'm sorry, there's three imperatives that Jesus puts as the price to follow him. You know, his disciples really didn't understand that, but he says first, deny yourself. Is that a challenge to you? It is to me. I think it probably is to all of us. First of all, to deny ourselves. In other words, to put everything that I think is important over here to the side and let's find out what God believes is important and work toward that. You know, deny yourself by following Him, serving God, and others daily. It's not just something that we can do once a week. We may come to church only once a week. But it's not something that we can do once a week if we're a true disciple. It, it just doesn't happen. Because Jesus challenged his disciples. Deny yourself. Follow me daily. Serve God daily. Serve others daily. That was a challenge to their thinking as it is today in our thinking. Second, bear your cross daily. Well, did he literally mean you may have a wooden cross to bear as he would later bear his cross to Calvary? There's a lot of different kind of crosses to be, to to be toted by a Christian servant. I'll name a few. I jotted down. Rejection. How many times was Christ teachings rejected. How many times would the disciples' teaching be rejected as well? Mistreatment. You know, ridiculed, embarrassed, 
beaten severely, humiliated, all of those things, and even to the point of death. So bearing the cross can mean many different things when Jesus was talking here. When he says, you know, every day, every day, you will have to do that. Let those that desire to come after me deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Well, if we are to follow Jesus, we know there's going to be some hardships. There's going to be some rejection. When he says, follow me, he is placing a call for lifelong, lifelong discipleship. You know, that's the challenge to me, and I guess maybe to many. Discipleship is lifelong once you're saved. It's not a, it's not a time and place that we're going to graduate in three or four years, just like you might do in college or something. But you, discipleship is a day-to-day, moment-by-moment calling that Jesus has placed upon us as believers to continue to be disciples that was challenged to them you know there might be some things that were positive in his ministry and they were but uh, there was hardships there was opposition to his teaching and he says there could be possibly even death if you follow me Uh, verse uh, 24 interesting too Listen to this, what he says. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Well, that kind of strange in a sense to us today to look at that, isn't it? But, he says, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Here's what we have to understand here, I believe. Any benefits of this world, any benefits of this world will be lost forever. They are only temporary on this side of eternity. But those who believe, if you and I are believers, if you and I are believers in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, and if we follow Christ, we will receive true life one day. Eternal, not temporal. And that'll be with Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit in a glorious heaven. You know, we... uh, we look at the next few verses and, and they're, they're more challenging every time Jesus asks a question. Look at 20, the 25th verse again. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? What profit is it to anyone if he gains this, this whole world It's only temporary gain. It would be a foolish trade for any of us to trade all the gain in this world, to trade that for eternity and glory with God. A poor trade. And you know, yet so many people are seemingly doing that today. They're looking to do whatever they can do and have all the fun and all the glory and all the wealth and all things that this world can give. Do you remember when Jesus was in the desert and was tempted by the devil? The devil offered him so many different things that were all temporary. Every one of those things that the devil could offer was temporary. And you know, we see that today. We see the devil is chasing everyone that is a believer to try to destroy their discipleship and their, and their integrity and their influence in this world. He will offer all that he has in this world because we know the ruler of darkness a little bit. We know a little bit about him. We know what he wants to do. He wants to destroy those and keep everyone else from from coming to know Jesus. You know, uh, verse 26, we look at that and we look at it and say, a disciple. And Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's glory and of the holy angels. You know, if we were to look at a disciple, someone that is not ashamed of Jesus Christ and his life and his work 
and wants to follow daily. Uh, let's flip over a few chapters to chapter 12. I want us to read just a few verses there. Uh, chapter 12, verses 4 through 9, I believe it is, let's see. Yes, Jesus is speaking here also. There was a big multitude of people gathered around uh, so much that they was stepping on each other and, and he begins to say to he began to say and preach and talk and uh, speak to his disciples first. But one of these things, and I'll pick it up in verse four, and I say to you, my friend, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are, not, are you not of more value than many sparrows? Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now Jesus continues to, to speak and to preach and to try to spread his word among his disciples, his early disciples there, that they may go out and carry on that message for the rest of their lives. You know, see, anybody, anybody that rejects Jesus, whether it was in that day and time or whether it's today's time, if we reject Jesus to preserve everything here we can have in this life, then they'll find they've lost everything of, in, of importance that is eternal. You know, there's that choice. The choice that we've heard this week in revival, the choice that we hear every sermon that we hear, every uh, Bible teaching that we hear. There is a choice. To accept Jesus as the promised Messiah, as the anointed one, as the Son of God, and to trust Him because He paid the price for you and I. But we can make a choice and we can say, no, not today. I'll try to do that maybe next week or when I get old, I'll do that. You know, we put off that. And so we have made a choice. It is a foolish choice to put it off because we're not guaranteed the next moment, much less in the next year. And the choice is such an unwise choice if we choose to reject Jesus and his plan for mankind. His saving grace is extended today. And so today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Nowhere in the Bible do I find it says wait till tomorrow to accept Jesus Christ. You know, we want to look at one other verse, and that's the last verse, and maybe... It's interesting that what Jesus says to these guys here, he says, but let me tell you truly, and, but I tell you truly. In other words, when he says that, to me that says, pay attention. I mean, that's my rendering. I'm telling you the truth, and so pay attention. He says, you can depend upon this promise that I'm about to tell you. The kingdom of God in this context, the one that Jesus is talking here, the kingdom of God in this context is not a place, not a place, but it is his active reign over his creation. Now think of that. It's not, the kingdom of God is not a place, but it's, it is the fact of his active reign over all of his creation. You know, some people will see the kingdom of God before they die. This is what Jesus has just said to them. And per, uh, approximately eight days later, who did see? Peter, James, and John, didn't? Weren't they the uh, ones there that saw the Son of Man in His glory at the Transfiguration? Yes. If you want to look at that, look at Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. We're well, just a little farther down. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that He took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his, of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. 
And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he had just said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered that cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet, and they told one of them, and they told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. And when Jesus said, Some of you are going to, before you, you die, you're going to see some. Uh, the kingdom of God, different parts and pieces of that. There was another time when more disciples witnessed the resurrected Christ, didn't they? Lots of people were witnesses to the resurrected Christ. And what about the day of Pentecost? When there were huge crowd gathered around, they saw the coming of the Holy Spirit there at Pentecost. Who did God allow to be the main preacher that day? Peter. So, you know, God is unfolding his plan. Jesus is trying to explain his plan here as it is about to happen and to come into play. And Jesus is challenging his disciples as he challenges you and I today. First challenge is he challenges us all to become a believer. To believe upon his work. To believe on all the promises that God has allowed and made available through his son Jesus. You know, the only, only way to ever know God in his fullest is to become a believer of his son and to one day be rewarded with an eternal life in a heavenly realm with them both, you know, and the Holy Spirit. You know, all believers are called upon to unashamedly follow Christ. They know they have no other option because they know the reality of the kingdom of God. Think of that. If you really look at all these things that the Bible tells us about our choice, our choice can either be temporary or eternal. But the eternal has two, has two things about it. You can be eternally apart from God in the devil's hell, or you can be eternally with God in heaven, in a glorious place. You know, so the choices that we make today can be eternal choices. You know, this truth that Jesus says, listen now, I'm going to tell you this truth, and you can count on it. It enabled the disciples to endure some of those hardships that he was talking about. You know, they were soon to face some of those very challenges that he'd just spoken of. And had they not knew and understood that truth, they would have fallen under the, under the task and under the pressure. I ask all of us as modern-day Christians, modern-day believers, are we prepared to suffer and endure hardships as a follower of Jesus Christ? Are we prepared to not be ashamed of Jesus and are we prepared to follow him for our life here you know those are the questions that I ask myself those are questions that I ask you I pray that you if you, if you don't know Jesus you will seek uh, to know him and, and seek out someone that maybe can help you if you do know Jesus Christ I, I challenge you to let's, let's love him more let's serve him better and let's speak of his great work to those that we come in contact with. I thank you for being with us today and I ask you to come and be with us at worship, be with us now in Sunday school, every opportunity you may have. Thank you.